Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar this morning. We're here with uh, David Castaneda from the Small Business Administration. He's going to start out talking about some of the uh, things that the SBA has uh, to offer to small businesses, uh, to help with small businesses and to help in this pandemic, uh, followed by Brian Ream, who's a, among other things, an advisor with the Small Business Development Center up here in uh, Shasta County, California. And he's going to talk about some of the scams that are out there that uh, we need to avoid. But at this point, I'm going to turn everything over to Mr. Castaneda and we'll get going. All right, thank you, Mr. Walker. Good morning, everybody. This is uh, David Castaneda and I'm an economic development specialist with the Small Business Administration. We're a federal agency. So we are located in every state, including Puerto Rico and Guam, which are uh, territories of the US. Um, our particular region of the SBA is, covers Northern California. Um, California being so big, we actually have six district offices in California. Most states only have one district office. Um, so today I'll be talking um, about the SBA programs and services and also the economic programs that we have had and that uh, to help people during this economic downturn due to the COVID. Um, some that have expired, but some that are still ongoing. Um, so we'll talk about that and in a little bit of our rest of our uh, programs and service that we have. So we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, let's see here. Let's move that screen up. Um, oh, just also another thing that I'd like to mention. Um, I am, uh, like most of us, I'm working remote. I'm in Northern California in the Sierra Mountains. Um, that's why I'm not sure um, I have my video off to because of the uh, internet bandwidth. But if I do happen to fall off, that happens sometimes. Um, Brian, you can go ahead and and take take get the um, your part of it going, and I'll try to get back as soon as I can, and when appropriate, I'll start mine back again um, if I haven't finished. Um, and I will be here to the end of the presentation uh, uh, to answer any questions. I'll be here to the very end. Okay, so again, we're going to talk about some of the programs uh, to help existing businesses that went through the economic downturn uh, due to the COVID. Uh, so we're going to get that started. So right here is a look at the four different programs uh, that SBA has um, or have had and that uh, some of them are still ongoing. OK, so, for example, to the far left, the Paycheck Protection Program, as you can see, that one did close. But there is a lot of individual business owners that are in the forgiveness part of it. So if that is you, we do have a little bit of information for you and places to get help if you need some help on that. And there's some changes for the um, for a positive good to help people with that loan forgiveness if that's a, uh, in a situation that you're in. OK, so that's the first one. The second one is the debt relief program and that one is still ongoing for it's going to be closing on the 31st of September very soon so if that is you it's a very good program you still might be able to um, um, utilize that program if you're in the market for getting a loan to either start or expand a business very good program the idle program that one's going to be going to the end of this year the 31st of December that one's ongoing that one's a direct loan through the SBA, which is a federal agency. So it's a direct loan uh, by, uh, um, from the federal government to you, the small business owner, okay? The next one is the Shuttered Venues Operator Grant. That one is ongoing, and um, that is to help certain entities to, to keep afloat during, again, this economic downturn. Um, the Restaurant Revitalization Program, as you can see, that one has closed um, and, and um, that was, again, to help restaurants, uh, brew pubs, and wineries um, get through this period of time. Uh, so some of them are uh, have closed. Some of them are still ongoing. Some of them are in a different phase, um, and, and we'll get through that. So if you were a person that did apply for that Paycheck Protection Program, which is a forgivable loan, 
Um, this is a little bit of um, uh, information for you. Um, if you did get that loan, again, 60% of those funds were uh, targeted towards payroll costs. The other 40% it can be used to pay rent and some other things. Um, uh, that was changed later, as you can see on the June 5th of 2020 to allow more flexibility on the use of those funds by business owners. Okay, at the end of the period that you, you're using those funds, you have 10 months, within 10 months to apply for the forgiveness of that particular loan. Um, otherwise it does turn into a loan where you do have to pay it, okay? Um, but if you do need help with that, we do have assistance for you, okay? And that is actually through the Small Business Development Center. And we do advise that you call your local Small Business Development Center for that assistance, okay? Um, again, the PPP loan forgiveness process, um, you submit your forgiveness application to your lender, so it, it, that's the normal process. Just recently, this has changed. Some lenders have opted to let the SBA handle those directly. So if you are a person that has a PPP uh, loan and you're working on the forgiveness still, you can go to our SBA website and you can click on the uh, PPP loan forgiveness or the loan program. And you can see if your lender was one of the ones that decided to participate and let the SBA work with you directly for the forgiveness. There's two things that have to be done where you can work directly with the SBA on the forgiveness part. Number one, the lender has to uh, uh, agree to do that. So that's number one, okay? Number two, your loan has to be under $150,000, okay? So if, if number one, your lender did agree to allow their borrowers to go directly to the SBA, that's great. And then number two, if your loan was under $150,000, then you can go directly to the SBA and we can work with you directly with that loan forgiveness, all right? And again, if you need help with this further, um, we do ask that you connect with your local small business development center because they do have consultants that can help you with this. Um, again, this is just talking about the different forms, um, but again, you'll get, you can get these on the sba.gov website also. And again, the SBDC consultants can help you through this. All right, so that was the forgiveness part of the Paycheck Protection Program. This particular program is one that's going to um, end on the, well, the, the part that the SBA is helping people with is going to end on the 31st of September. But these particular loan programs, the SBA microloan, the 7A loan, 504 loan, these are loans we have always. They're always ongoing. They've been going for decades and they'll still be going no matter what. Okay. So these are, so let's go through these. So the first one is the SBA microloan. Okay. That is for, let's say, uh, in, uh, entrepreneur that's just starting their business or even an existing business uh, person that's, let's say, working out of their home and just needs a, a smaller type loan. These are from anywhere from $5,000 to $50,000. The way this program works, SBA loans a pool of money to nonprofit lenders. For example, in Sacramento region, um, we have a nonprofit lender called Opening Doors. So they will lend this money out for us in the community of the greater Sacramento area. What's good about these nonprofit lenders that do microloans, they have a little bit more flexibility on the individual's credit score. So if, if your credit score might be a little bit, uh, you know, in an area where you're, you're needing help, a lot of times the micro lenders can be more flexible. The other thing, they can help an individual put together all their financials, uh, and other things help them fill out the, the application. So things a normal lender normally cannot do. So they can be more hands-on on helping an individual prepare and get all the information qualified for 
getting a loan eventually, okay? Many times these nonprofit lenders work hand in hand with SBDC consultants to help the individual get prepared. For example, the nonprofit might refer you to a local SBDC to get the technical assistance to help get prepared and then sent back to the to the micro lender to to then get your loan okay so again you'll notice i'll be mentioning the small business development center because they do a lot of uh consulting individual and specific consulting in different areas okay and again they are part of the sba umbrella uh, nationwide and that's why uh, I, I definitely refer people to the small business development center quite a bit the next one, the 7A loan program. So again, if you either if you're just starting a business or again in business and you want to grow and expand your business, this is another program nationwide. It's one of the largest used programs in United States to help uh, small business people and entrepreneurs get the funding they need to start and grow a business. The way this program works, it's a good partnership between the SBA, which again is the federal government and the private banking industries, which are national banks, could be Wells Fargo, US Bank, uh, Chase Bank. It could be a community bank, for example, in, in California area, Plumas Bank, Tri-County Bank, Bank of Stockton, or it could be a credit union in Sacramento area. Uh, Safe Credit Union is very uh, active in our loan program. The way it works is you would go to one of those lenders and there's hundreds of these lenders. It's not just the ones I mentioned. There's hundreds of these lenders that participate. You as the borrower would take your business plan there and you'd fill out the application at the lender's office. Okay. The lender would then review your application and they would decide whether to approve the loan or not. If they do approve it, they then send it electronically to the SBA where we stamp the guarantee on it. And then the bank gives you their money and you pay the bank back up to seven to 10 years. Okay. That's that. So the terms are seven to 10 years where you pay your loan back on a monthly basis. Okay. What is the guarantee? What that does, it reduces the risk to the lender. Okay. And how does it reduce the risk to the lender? If for some reason the borrower defaults on the loan, the lender will then, uh, for example, if the borrower defaulted two years into the loan, the borrow, the lender would then come to the SBA said, okay, the borrower paid so much money uh, and, and, and to, towards that loan, but we still have a balance. And then the SBA would pay up to 85% of that balance of the loan back to the lender. So the lender is out very little money. Okay, so that's how the, the risk is reduced to the lender. So they're able to do more loans uh, to either startups or existing businesses. Okay, so those loans can be used for just about anything and for any use for starting and in, in expanding a business. The next one, 504 loan program. That one is, uh, again, for mostly existing businesses that are looking to purchase a building for their business or property for their business, okay? That's a good program because in this particular program, there are certified development companies. They're nonprofit lenders that work on the behalf of the SBA. So you would go again to one of these certified development companies. And again, working with your local small business development center consultant, they know the ones in the general area that they can hook you up with. So you can go there first to get prepared and then go to the certified development companies and apply for a loan to purchase a building or property. So as the borrower, you would put in 10% into the venture. SBA would put in 40% of the funds to purchase the, the building or the property. And then a lender would come in and put in the other 50%. So that certified development company is very instrumental in pulling all three of the, the um, funder, funders together. So the borrower, the SBA, and a, a bank will be brought in by the certified development company on behalf of the SBA you know, to help individuals get these loans. And of course, the borrower, you, to help you buy that building. So once you get the funds all together, then you purchase the building 
and then you pay back the SBA, the 40% that the SBA put in, and then you also pay back the 50% that the lender put in over a 25 year period, okay? Now here is the next part that I'm gonna show you that pertains to those three loan programs. And this is the one that's gonna end on 30 September, okay? So this is a good deal if you are in the market for a loan, but again, the window is getting very short now. You only got a month and a half uh, approximately before this is gonna be closing, okay? So this is how this program works. For the, and this again is for this, the, the micro loan program, our 7A and 504 loan program. So for loans approved on or after February 1st, 2021 through September 30th, 2021, SBA will pay three months of principal and interest after the loan is fully dispersed and after any deferments capped at 9,000 per loan per month, okay? It is subject to funding availability. Borrowers do not need to apply for this debt relief. SBA provides it automatically, okay? So again, if you're in the market for a loan, this is a good program uh, that is still running if, if that's um, something that you're um, looking to do. Okay, next one. Now, this particular program, Economic Entry Disaster Loan, or we call it the EIDL loan, this one is, again, a direct loan through the SBA, which is a federal government, and you would go to the sba.gov website to apply for this loan. This is a direct loan for non, I'm sorry, for for-profit businesses. The interest rate on those loans that go up for up to 30 years, okay? So you, you, you make your monthly payments over a term of 30 years. The interest rate is 3.75%, okay? And it's fixed. If you're a nonprofit, it's 2.75% and, and that is fixed. Again, once you get the funds from the SBA put into your bank account, you have up to a year before you start making those monthly payments, okay? And then after that year deferment, then you start making those monthly payments over a period of 30 years, okay? There is no um, penalty if you decide that, let's say three years down the road, you're doing great in your business and you can pay it off completely uh, early prepayment and there's no uh, prepayment penalty. So that one is ongoing, it's a good program. Again, um, we get in a lot, a lot of small businesses that are still looking to get this direct loan from the SBA. Again, this one ends on the 31st of December of this year. So you still have time. So this one, this is a grant program. And this one is for uh, specific type of businesses. So here are the uh, list of types of businesses you have to be to apply for this particular grant. And again, this is to help small businesses that were affected during the period of the economic downturn due to COVID. So you have to be a live venue operator or promoter, the, the theatrical producer, live performing arts organization, and motion picture theater operators, museum operators, zoos, aquariums, who meet specific criteria talent representatives, up to five business entities owned by an eligible entity that also meet the eligible or eligibility requirements, okay? You must have been in operation as of February 29th, 2020, okay? Because this is a grant program, there are special uh, rules, criteria, and restrictions that govern this. So for example, SBA, personnel cannot work with an individual one-on-one. -on -one. Um, that's just part of the restrictions. We have to just refer you to sba.gov forward slash SVO grants. There's a lot of good information on there, uh, tutorials, frequently asked questions, and, and then eventually you'll be uh, go through a portal and you'll be working with grant management specialists that um, will work with you through this, okay? All right, so I think that was the, the four programs. I'm gonna back up real quick. So these were the four programs we talked about, the Paycheck Protection Program, which is in the loan forgiveness phase. Okay, the debt relief program, that's the one uh, with the, seven, the 7A 504 microloans. 
And that's the one where uh, uh, SBA will pay three months of your first payments, but that ends on the 30th of September of this year. So that you got a small window before that closes. The next one is the idle loan program. That one is a direct loan from the federal government at 3.75% if you're for-profit. And that one ends at the end of the year, 31st of December of this year. And then the Shuttered Venue Operators Grant, that's for specialized businesses that are in the performing arts type industry. And that is ongoing right now. Okay, so that one is, those are the only ones that are ongoing um, that you can utilize. All right, so we're, we're done with the uh, loan programs to help people start and grow a business and also to help you through the economic downturn. Uh, the other part of SBA is we have a contracting <clears throat> program to help those businesses expand your market and, and your sales and hopefully to help grow your business. So we can help you uh, sell your products or services to the federal government. And there's many programs and services that we have. Uh, one of them through the SBA is called the 8A Business Development Program. It's a nine-year program to take a uh, let's say uh, a business that has never been in the federal government arena before and through a nine-year program, it helps grow their business and it, it, it will even get contracts to them that are coming uh, through the, the, uh, um, the funnel there. And here's the thing on this 8A program, if you are qualified for an 8A business, all throughout United States, federal different federal agencies have goals they have to meet to get 8A contracts, okay? So they're looking for businesses that can fulfill different services and needs for the federal government. So it's a very good program if, if that's something you're interested in. The other one is the historically underutilized business zone, hub zone program. And that's if you're in a particular area that's designated a hub zone, you get a special preference as you bid on federal contracts. Again, another good program, okay? We also have women-owned small business program and service-disabled veteran-owned programs. So all of these programs here that are available, a uh, lot of the federal agencies out there that are looking to um, bring in small businesses also have to look and have goals of meeting these particular programs. Again, the service-disabled veteran-owned program, they have to meet a certain percentage of uh, small business have to be that certified or women own small business. So a lot of help out there if you need it. OK, so again, if you do, you can call our office, uh, the SBA.gov website you can go to. Um, you can connect with your local SBDC office because they also have good information on that. All right. So you heard me talk a lot about the Small Business Development Center. And that's the, the reason why is because SBA has a nationwide network of resource partners, okay? And the first one is one of our biggest programs that we have to help small businesses. And this is the part where I really love because they provide training, a lot of good information, uh, webinars, and then direct consultings on many different topics to help small business either start or grow their business. So how this works is the SBDC, um, again, they provide free business consulting, whether you're a startup or in, in the growth stage of your business or just need help better managing your business. Um, they also supplement that with different webinars and trainings, okay? So very good program and they're nationwide. They cover every county in the United States. So you can always find them anywhere. The next one is the Women's Business Center. Again, just like the SBDC, they provide free business consulting and also provide a lot of good webinars. They're a little bit more heavy on training and webinars. Um, so they're very good to take a look at. We have two of them in our Northern California area, one in Sacramento, one in Mount Shasta. Um, good thing about this, it is open and equal to all. So men, 
they, I, I, every time I've done presentations, it's usually 50, 50 men and women that are uh, attending these presentations. So men also can go and utilize the services and, and look at the webinars at the Women's Business Center. Very good. The next one is SCORE. SCORE is a volunteer organization. And what's good about SCORE, a lot of the volunteers are business owners or work in industries uh, as CEOs, presidents, things like that, or maybe even uh, a legal or an HR person. Um, but they're using their knowledge, experience, and specialized services to help, again, small business uh, expand and grow or help somebody start a business, okay? Free consulting, a lot of good webinars also through SCORE. Veteran Business Outreach Center. Now, this is the only one where it is specialized and you do have to show proof that you were in the military. So you have to show that you're either, either an active military personnel or a veteran. OK, and you do have to show proof of that. It's also for the spouse of a veteran or active duty military that can utilize these services. Now, if you are a veteran, you can use not only the VBOC, but you can also use the other resources, SCORE, the Women's Business Center and the Small Business Development Center. So, again, SBA is the largest funder of all of these programs nationwide, and they, they are under the umbrella of the SBA nationwide also. OK, so what I recommend because especially in California, there's a lot of things that are going on. State of California looks like they're going another round of grants, okay? A um, lot of these, our resource partners are connected in the community. And if you connect on their e-newsletter, you will find out about what's going on, not only in your local area, but throughout the state of California that can help you. So I recommend getting on each one of their e-newsletters, okay? Because a lot of good information. All right, let me move on. Um, resource partners, again, in Northern California. Uh, there's the NorCal SBDC, a lot of good information there uh, that rolls up all the SBDCs in Northern California. Good to take a look at their calendar events because it, it shows uh, pretty much all of the SBDC webinars in Northern California. Women's Business Center, that's how you can reach our two in our Northern California area. Very good webinars on both of them. So take a look at that. Um, Fraud alert. Hey, we got a specialist that will talk more about that. But of course, we're even seeing a lot of fraud. So, you know, be careful on that. Uh, if you need to contact SBA, if you are in the IDLE program, that's the uh, signing up for the Economic Injury Disaster Loan. These are some links, emails, phone numbers to call because we have seen uh, people needing assistance. So these are the direct numbers to call in that program because that's that's where you have to call to get help or information or status, okay? If you wanna call our particular office in Sacramento, Northern California, um, you can um, email us at sacramento underscore do at sba.gov. And that concludes my particular part of the uh, presentation. We're gonna have the next one coming up right now. Uh, that is Brian and I will be here to the end of the presentation if you have any questions, okay? So Brian, um, I'm gonna pass it on to you. And if you wanna share your screen, I think I turned mine off. All right, here we go. David, thank you for that. Um, and again, let me welcome you to this portion of uh, the webinar where I'll be covering common scams, uh, just targeting small businesses, but these really apply to you personally, um, as well as large businesses. And um, as, as David has mentioned, this is brought to you by the uh, SBDC Shasta Cascade office. Um, and a lot of some of these slides, um, I'll be able to go through quickly. You have, uh, you will be receiving these slides as well as this recording. So no need to feel like you need to take notes or anything like that. Um, and also as I breeze through some of these slides, no need to stress, you'll receive this deck. Um, I do have to read this, this is a disclaimer. Um, so let me just quickly read through it as fast as I can. The information provided in this webinar and any supplemental materials provided to registrants are intended for educational information purposes only 
and does not constitute professional financial legal advice. No registrant should act or fail to act on the basis of any material contained in this webinar without obtaining proper financial, legal, or other professional advice specific to their situation. Northern California Small Business Development Center and its host, the HSU Sponsored Programs Foundation, specifically disclaims any liability, loss, or risk, personal or otherwise, which is incurred as a consequence directly or indirectly of the use and application of any of the information presented in this webinar. All right. I'm not going to go in about me, but I'm one of the advisors here at the, like I said, the Shasta Cascade SBDC office. And uh, today we're going to talk about uh, business scams. So uh, I'll skip the introduction to the Small Business Development Center because they did a great job kind of uh, talking about how we fit into the grand scheme of things. Um, we'll talk about what business scams are and overview of the most common scams, as well as tips to avoid them. And uh, we'll just have a brief conclusion and an opportunity for you to you know, ask questions. If you have a question anytime, you can just put it in the chat section and um, someone will be monitoring that. If it applies to the group, um, we may stop and answer that question, but most likely we'll just uh, wait to answer all the questions at the end of this webinar. All right, so the, the biggest thing that I just wanna mention about these uh, SBDC, uh, if you find a center local to you, uh, it's no cost and we provide training services to small businesses, all the loan steps and all that stuff um, that David laid out, we help you we can help you walk through that application process. We provide webinar training, uh, funding assistance, and um, we're in partnership with the SBA. So let's get to uh, scams. Uh, I like how, oops, I forgot the I on the end. That is not Facebook that defined it. Um, that is missing an I. I'll fix these slides before we send it out. Um, but it's dishonest and illegal activities perpetrated by individuals or companies in order to provide an advantageous financial outcome to those persons or establishments. And that's quoted from the FBI. Um, you know, what is a scam? It's any type of activity, uh, whether it's illegal or not, it could be legal, but it could be completely dishonest. And it's, it's simply for the financial gain of that company or that individual. Uh, it's to dupe you. It's to swindle you out of money it's to lie um, and cheat and as long as there have been businesses scams have existed and nowadays because of technology as technology continues to to make leaps and bounds forward uh, the effectiveness and the ability of scammers has also increased so it's really important for you as a small business owner to be aware um, of these scams and not to be naive uh, to be informed. I know some of us, we love to trust everybody and we see everybody as a business opportunity, uh, but it's important to know that scams are out there and to, to use your knowledge of what scams could be, what the scams are, so you're not, you don't fall prey to them. Um, you know, the most common scams, the number one scam that has caused the most losses more than any other scam in the U.S. is business email compromise. And um, that could take on several different forms, which result in compounding scams. Um, but one of the most common ones is that your email is compromised. Uh, whether a hacker just guesses your email because they do research on you and your business and you have a weak password, or would they use, they use some sort of hacking software or malware whether it's an attachment that you accidentally clicked on um, as part of an email that you received or whether it's just uh, email compromise from the DNS that you use, they break into your email. And once they break into your email, whatever information you have in your email, um, whether it's just your username and password or your financial account information is usually what they're going after or their contacts that they can continue to you know, propagate their scam. Um, that's why email compromise is such a big one. Um, it also includes when you receive an email uh, from a company that looks very similar uh, to a company that you already do business with. 
and they do that to trick you and, and fraud you into conducting business with them instead of the reputable business. Um, they can send invoices, uh, they can send attachments. Uh, once they get into someone's email, um, they can send you an email and you believe it's that person or it's actually been compromised. So business email compromise is, is very, very important. Um, and we'll go through tips on how to avoid these scams at the end, but you know, I'll just mention, it's always good to ask for trusted info. Um, it's always good to contact the people that are sending you an email if you have a question, is this legit or is this valid? Sometimes they don't even realize that their business email has been compromised. And I'm sure I would appreciate if someone received an email from me and they didn't sound like me, didn't seem like me, if they said, hey, did you send this? And then I could be like, no, I did it. Oh, my email must have been compromised. So asking questions you'll see is one of the number one tips. Um, but usually the emails that have been compromised are asking you directly for trusted information, username, password, company data. Usually when they're asking for that type of private personal information, uh, it's probably a scam. Business email compromise also leads to fake invoices. Uh, where they can use a compromised email or they just send you a, a fake invoice that looks very similar to an invoice you may already be paying or a common type of invoice format. Uh, but they generate a fake invoice based off of your existing purchase activity, uh, based off of services they may think you as a business would use. And uh, if you're not going through your invoices carefully, you may end up just paying it. So they love to send invoices, especially if you're receiving a lot of invoices and you have a pay cycle at the end of the month and you're just kind of going through your invoices uh, without checking, uh, This you can fall prey to fake invoices. And they do a really good job. They do a really good job of cloning uh, legitimate invoices. So you have to really be careful to make sure you understand who you're paying and what that invoice was for. Directory scams. Um, directory scams is usually someone will call you or contact your business and say, hey, I'm generating a exclusive list of companies in your field to be distributed to a targeted audience. And usually they'll ask you for your company's information. It, it'll seem very legitimate un until you receive the bill for it. <laughs> and usually it's a very, very high a charge and the directory either doesn't exist or it does exist, but it's not really distributed to the people you thought it was going to be distributed. It's not really published where they said it would be published. A lot of times they may claim that it's free and then they actually send you a bill. Um, I've heard of people where they will uh, record, scammers will record the conversation, edit that conversation and replay it back where they say, hey, do you agree to these charges? And then they'll edit in a yes uh, that you've said to some other uh, you know, question. So you have to be really careful uh, with directory scams. Usually if it's um, from a re reputable company, you can do research on that company, but most of the time they're just saying, hey, we wanna list you or hey, you've made it to the top uh, award or category of our directory, pay this amount and we'll list you um, in our directory. Uh, it's not to be confused with, for instance, paying for a promotion on Google. Usually it's, it's uh, specialized for your industry or someone will just cold call you and say, we wanna include your company information. Two issues, one, they usually ask you for very personal information about you and your company. Um, and usually they say, you know, it's, to be distributed and you can't find any information on that company or that directory, then you typically know that it's a scam. The biggest thing is they usually bill you and you receive a, a very, very large bill for a directory that doesn't exist. Phishing scams um, are, are very popular and you probably have an inbox full of phishing emails. Uh, but they will generate emails that are very realistic. I get them from PayPal all the time. Uh, your PayPal account has been compromised. Please log in here and change your username and password. 
or hey, your bank has been compromised, uh, change your password. And they will use the logo, they'll use the same font head, they'll use the branding um, of that legitimate organization to get you to click on that link and enter your information. They'll even create pages uh, that are launched from the email that look just like the legitimate business. Um, and so they use fear as a tactic to get you to submit your username and password. Um, just really quickly, the easiest way to tell um, if it's from a legitimate sender or not is just to check the email address. Uh, who is a sender from? If it's from that organization, tricountiesbank.com, then probably it's from that organization. But usually they're from some crazy email address that doesn't make any sense. And then you know, okay, this is not legitimate. So that's a really quick way to check. The other quick way is obviously to call, call the bank, call PayPal, call whoever they claim to be and say, hey, is this true? Um, Vanity award scams are also really popular. Uh, usually they will notify your business that you've won or you've been selected or you're popular or because of your amazingness, uh, they want to award you with a vanity award. Um, it might be, hey, uh, you've received the front page of this publication. And if you pay $300 by tomorrow, we'll make sure that gets printed ASAP and blah, blah, blah. And there are usually always scams. Uh, it's always a ploy just for money. Uh, maybe it is a publication, but it's not distributed as widely as you may think. Um, and they always are looking for money. Uh, usually genuine awards that you win um, are from reputable organizations and industries that you can research. Uh, they, they try to pull on your pride and your ego a little bit um, to get you to pay to pay out. Um, so obviously you wanna check and make sure it's a legitimate award and uh, be very clear on the terms. Again, asking questions is key here. Um, I'm a part of a group. We haven't even really started doing business and we were <laughs> receiving all these requests to do publications. And I'm like, well, I know you're a scam because we haven't even done anything yet. Like, so typically they, they get your name just from business registries and things like that. And they'll just, you know, do a broad send. Uh, so again, here, you know, yeah, it's nice to think that maybe you're at the top of your industry or someone's recognizing you for your hard work, but it's really important to check your ego and do some research and ask some questions. Charity scams are big, especially here in Northern California with the fires. Um, they will create fake charities, especially around natural, especially around disasters. So there are a couple here where, you know, we had some large fires in Northern California, we still have them going on and scammers will create uh, funds and they'll reach out to small businesses and say, hey, will you sponsor this fund? Uh, for you to be a premier donor, give this amount, um, and you will be on the, you know, you'll be on the top list, only to find out that the charity doesn't exist, or the charity is a front. And so this one is really, really hard, uh, obviously, because they pull on your heartstrings. We all want to know we can, as small businesses, contribute to the welfare and the benefit our, of our community. And so they use that against you. They, uh, they will call and say, we're putting together a fund or we're helping kids in need or education um, and they will get you to donate. Um, they may, like I said, even exist, but they're fronts. And so that's, that's a big one, especially around natural disasters that you have to be aware of and you have to really do a, a good amount of research. Um, and then there's the typical insurance fraud where, um, you know, they'll slip and fall or they'll do other activities to fake injury. And so you, you have, just have to be aware that that is happening, that it's common. People are looking for opportunities to take advantage of your business. Tips to avoid it. I'd say the number one tip is simply education. Uh, be educated on these scams. And uh, I didn't even provide the exhaustive list. There's, there's, a lot more. These are just the most common ones. And be aware of, of what the scams are and train your team. So education is really, really key. 
uh, so that you're aware of what they are and what they look like. And you can kind of be like, oh, this sounds similar to something I remember reading about. Let me do some more research. So education is the best way to avoid falling victim to a scam. Um, don't give out sensitive information. If they're asking for personal information, they're probably wanting to do something <laughs> inappropriate with that. Keep private information private. Again, this goes to training your team members because if you're not the one answering the phone, um, you have to just really make sure your team is aware uh, and you set the ground rules. Hey, we don't give out private information unless it goes through a certain checks or if it's for a certain reason. Uh, but it's best to just lay a rule and say, hey, we don't give out private information. Um, obviously, if it's for your bank or for a legitimate relationship that you have, then you can verify. Uh, the need for that private information disclosure. You know, verify the sources, make sure they are who they say they are, whether that's checking the email address or that's a follow-up call. That's the easiest thing to do is pick up the phone and say, is this you? Did you ask for this information? Um, that's that's a simple way to avoid a lot of, a lot of issues is to verify the source. And that goes to researching and asking questions. Um, if it's a reputable company, they won't have a problem with you asking questions. Usually scammers get uncomfortable. Uh, they don't have a valid reason. They can't give a, a valid answer and they'll hang up. Um, so do your own research. If it's a charity, call around, see if other people know about that charity. Uh, do research on the internet. Uh, a lot of times the FTC Federal Trade Commission, they have a directory of, of common scams that, that people report. Um, see if it's actually legitimate. Do use the internet to your advantage. Um, and I like the ask questions the most. Uh, like, why do you need this information? Like, can I talk to someone else in your organization? Um, asking questions usually is the best way to begin to uncover whether something is legitimate or not. Especially with invoices and awards, what was this for? Um, a lot of times it's researching your own uh, information history. Like, did I order this? Is there a record of me ordering this product? Um, did we actually use these services? And, and researching each invoice, if you don't have uh, an automatic system that, that aggregates your invoices, just a little bit of effort goes a long way to help you avoid a lot of these scams. Um, the easiest one is just do not, do not click. Uh, I'm sure all of us receive so many emails with all these attachments. Uh, before they were obvious, it used to say, click me, click me. Uh, now these attachments aren't as, as obvious as that. You know, It might be like, hey, this is a report I worked on, or hey, uh, check out this advertisement, or you requested this quote. You know, and you just you just end up clicking on it. So, um, if it's not from an email you recognize, or if it's from an un unrecognized email, or if it's just a topic that you have no idea, just don't click the email. Uh, don't click the attachment um, and delete that email. Um, I talk to a lot of small business owners uh, that make that mistake where they're they receive a lot of emails, um, and a lot of them could be leads. A lot of them could be communication with vendors, I mean, it's things that are essential to your business. Um, and so I understand sometimes you get in that rush and you're just going through and you're just clicking on things, but just taking a moment to slow down a little bit um, can save a lot of headache. The last thing you want is to, you know, install a malware, a Trojan horse, you know, virus on your, on your machine. So really uh, just take your time. And if it's from an unsolicited email or something that causes you to question it, it's best not to click it. Inspect your invoices. I know that sounds funny, but again, especially if you're on a cycle where you go through a lot of invoices quickly, um, sometimes you are not paying attention and you're just paying out invoices. Um, don't just blindly pay them. Make sure there were things that, for goods that you ordered and services that you received. Again, check the source. Uh, make sure that the invoice is correct. And last and most effective is just to use common sense. Um, if you haven't been in a space and all of a sudden you're receiving a vanity award for things that you didn't do, it's probably a scam. Um, 
you know, common sense can go a long way in helping you. And I know sometimes for those of you who have employees, you know, it's like, yeah, what's that pill that I can give all my employees that they would get some common sense? Um, but it's just training, it's just education, and it's just taking the time to get your team together and even going through this deck and saying, hey, let's be on the lookout for this. Hey, if you receive an email or receive a phone call that's suspect, uh, put them on hold, get their information, and we'll call them back. You know, using common sense and using education can, can go a really, really long way. Uh, so in conclusion, um, you want to take the time to really educate your team. Don't be a statistic. Um, again, like I've said, uh, routine reminders to your team, even having sticky notes up on uh, by the phones or on monitors of computers that you and your team may use. Just to be simple visual reminders uh, has been an effective team that, thing that a lot of businesses use. And report scams to the FTC. Um, there's the link. Um, if you suspect or realize that something's a scam, help yourself out, help another business out, report it to the FTC. You can also use the FTC as a resource um, to say, hey, is this vanity ward a scam? Um, they usually list common um, scams that have been reported by other businesses for the same reason so that you don't fall prey to those businesses. And so I, I'd like to take the time to answer any questions. Um, David, I don't know, or Emily, I don't know if people have been um, asking questions. Um, we had one come in privately here um, that I believe you answered. Uh, how can you tell if a charity is a front or a fraud? And uh, I know you mentioned a couple of things. One thing I'd like to add is there's a site called Charity Navigator, uh, which is a, a reputable site that will uh, that rates charities based on their based on their performance. So yes. uh, that is one thing. And of course, you mentioned making sure the names and the uh, website addresses match. And Anne is asking, do you have anything to add to that, Brian? Or? Yeah, I would say. I mean, charities uh, that can be difficult. I mean, I, if a scammer really, really goes out of their way, and it's a it's a robust scam. Um, there could be uh, a valid charity front, but typically the more you ask questions, um, the better. So doing research and asking questions is really the best way. And the only thing that you can do a part of, apart from maybe it being listed as a scam. Um, I, I would say most of the scammers don't go through that type of effort. You know, they're looking for easy prey. It's kind of like thieves in a parking lot are looking for that car that are, you know, the doors are unlocked. And so typically when you uh, provide a little bit of resistance, it's not worth their time. They're looking for someone that's just going to, um, you know, fall victim easily. So uh, just asking questions, I think is a really good way. Getting on the phone with someone saying, hey, can I talk to someone? about this charity, I'd like, really like to find out more. How are the funds distributed? Where are they going toward? Um, you know, asking those types of questions, I think. Um, and then trusting your instincts. Um, you know, what's the, what's the worst thing that could happen is you decide to say no, um, you know? So trusting your instinct and not feeling guilty about saying no because you don't feel comfortable um, I think is really, really big. I know that's hard, especially when uh, there are issues around disasters and when we know people need our help. Um, but uh, trusting your instincts when you feel like something is a little off is better than you giving a lot of your hard-earned money to an organization that doesn't exist. So I hope that helps. Yeah. Um, Anne is asking a very good one. Uh, is anyone aware of an ERTC scam, uh, the employee tax? retention tax credit. So she was approached by a company saying they can get her uh, ERTC money back from the government. Her payroll company told her she didn't qualify and her accountant told her it was a scam. Um, I can tell you this, Anne, if uh, you have any question about the employee retention tax credit, contact the SBDC. We don't charge you anything. 
to help you look into that. <laughs> um, uh, and anybody that would charge you to do that when you're already paying for an account and then a payroll company uh, is, is probably suspect. Yeah. You know, but, uh, one thing I didn't touch on, but I know it's out there with, with a lot of these programs that even David had uh, started this session with, um, there are scans out there uh, offering to help businesses with enrollment or application or even fast track to loan approval or grant approval. Um, the best thing is to contact the SBA and the SBDC. As uh, David just mentioned, you know, the SBDC provides no cost help, uh, but usually uh, the SBA is aware um, as well of, hey, these scams have been circulating and the SBDC is aware of that as well. So even reaching out to the local office here or your local office, if you're not located in Northern California, can go a long way in helping uncover whether or not um, aid like that is a scam. I don't see any other questions uh, at this point. I don't know, Emily, are you on? If, you, if so, do you see any questions? Um, yeah, no other questions. We've got four minutes, Ryan, if you'd like to break into song. <laughs> uh, no, I'm good. I would just like to, I think, uh, just as a closing statement, um, the last thing I want is for a small business owner to become paranoid and suspicious of every single thing in email, uh, because email a lot of times is a is our livelihood. You know, we receive business contacts, communications, relationships are developed through email. You know, uh, a lot of transactions, invoices, things like that happen through email. So uh, I'm not saying, you know select all delete <laughs> all your emails um i understand the, the tension uh, but uh, just a little bit of awareness and a little bit of caution will go will go a, a very very long way i think a lot of times we get comfortable because we're in email and we're receiving if we're a small business we're receiving emails from strangers because we're a public business and anyone can contact us um, but uh, just being aware of these common scams can, can really be helpful, um, especially because they are, uh, they're out there. And I'd, I'd rather have you as small business owners be slightly sus uh, suspicious um, instead of completely naive and you know, have something catastrophic happen to your business. So um, as we mentioned, this deck, um, this presentation is being recorded and this deck will be distributed to you. Um, if you uh, have any other questions, please feel free, um, the last slide here, uh, to reach out to us at this SPDC office. Um, if you're not part of our area, Shasta and Trinity County in California, you can still reach out to us and we will help you get connected with your local SPDC office. I know we have some people outside our, our county area, our region area. Um, so please contact us. Uh, if you enjoy these types of webinars, um, we will be conducting some additional webinars this month as well. You can follow us on Facebook. Um, and all of these webinars that are being recorded are also put on our YouTube channel. And there's a ton of information from how to start your business, to financial um, advice, to QuickBooks and other tips and tricks um, that could be really beneficial. So take advantage of the resources that we have. Um, again, it's at no cost to you. Follow us on our social channels uh, so you could be aware of the other events uh, that we'll be having in the coming months. And uh, if there are other questions, Oh, I'd like to say one other thing uh, real quick. I put a link in the chat to a uh, survey. Uh, please click on the link. We'll also send the link in the email. Uh, let us know how we did. And if you have any suggestions for topics you would like us to cover, please add those uh, in the survey. Uh, the reason we're doing this is because uh, somebody asked for a webinar on scams. Uh, the reason we do a lot of the webinars is because people have asked us uh, to cover this stuff. 
So um, feel free to provide any suggestions you have. If you, uh, and believe me, if please be honest, we have thick skin, we can take it. Uh, we This is the way we try to improve. So mm -hmm. really encourage you to respond to that. Yes. Okay. Nothing else. I think we're ready to turn it off. Thank you, Mr. Castaneda. I appreciate your uh, your help with this. Uh, thank you, Mr. Walker and Brian. Very informative. Good good uh, topics there. I like it. My pleasure. All right, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you so much.